This was Antony's statement, and it was approved by the other fathers. But in order to confirm what St. Antony said, by means of fresh examples from our own times, we should recall Abba Hiram, and how a few days ago, as we ourselves saw, he was thrown down from the height of the ascetic state to the depths of death by the deception of the devil. We know how he spent some fifty years in the nearby desert, following a life of great severity in the strictest self-control, seeking out and living in parts of the desert, wilder than those inhabited by any of the other monks there. This same man cast all the fathers and brothers of the nearby desert into a consolable grief because, after so many labors and struggles, he was deceived by the devil and suffered such a disastrous fall. This would not have happened to him had he been armed with the virtue of discrimination, which would have taught him to trust not his own judgment, but rather the advice of his fathers and brethren. Following his own judgment, he fasted and isolated himself to such a degree that he did not even come to church for the Holy Pascha, lest by meeting the fathers and brethren and feeding with them, he would be obliged to eat lentils or whatever else was brought to the table, thereby appearing to fall short of the target which he had set himself. He had already, for long, been deceived in this way by his own willfulness when, coming upon an angel of Satan, he bowed down before him as if he were an angel of light. The angel commanded him to hurl himself around midnight into a very deep well so that he might then know by experience, because of his great virtue and ascetic efforts, that he would never again be subject to any danger. His darkened mind failed to discern who was suggesting this to him, and he hurled himself into the well during the night. Soon afterwards, the brethren, discovering what had happened, were only just able to pull him up half dead. He lived for two more days and died on the third, plunging his brethren and the priest Paphnupi Paphnutius into great grief. The latter, moved by feelings of compassion and remembering Huron's numerous labors and the many years during which he had pers persevered in the desert, mentioned his name in the oblation for the dead so that he should not be numbered among those who have taken their own lives. And what am I to say about those two brethren who lived beyond the desert of the Theba, Thebaid, where the blessed Antony once lived, impelled by a thought, the real nature of which they could not discern, they decided to go into the vast, uncultivated inner desert and they even made up their minds to refuse food offered them by man and to accept only what the Lord would give them in a miraculous fashion. Finally, they were seen in the distance, wandering about the desert, weak with hunger, by the Mazakes, who, though fiercer and wilder than almost all other savage peoples, now providentially exchanged their natural wildness for humane feelings and went to meet them carrying loaves of bread. One of the two brethren accepted the bread with joy and thanksgiving, since his power of discrimination had returned, and he realized that such wild and fierce men, who normally rejoice at the sight of blood, would not have felt sympathy with them in their exhaustion and brought them food if God had not moved them to it. The other, however, refused the food on the grounds that it was offered him by men, and persisting in his, in his undiscriminating judgment, he died from the weakness brought on by his hunger. 
both monks at first showed total lack of judgment and made a senseless and destructive plan. One of them, however, when his power of discrimination returned, corrected the decision he had made so recklessly. But the other, persisting in his stupid and undiscriminating plan, brought upon himself the death which he, which the Lord had wanted to avert. What am I to say about another monk whose name I do not wish to mention because he is still alive? He frequently entertained a demon as if he were an angel and received revelations from him, often seeing what looked like the light of a lamp in his cell. Later, he was ordered by this demon to offer his son as a sacrifice to God. His son was staying with him in the monastery on the grounds that he would, as a result, be deemed worthy of the honor accorded to the patriarch Abraham. He was so led astray by the demon's advice that he would have carried out the sacrifice of his son had the latter not seen him, contrary to his normal practice, sharpening a knife and preparing the bonds with which he was going to tie him up like a burnt offering. This enabled the son to make his escape. It would take me a long time to give an account of the deception of that Mesopotamian monk who, having shown great self-control, shutting himself up in his cell for many years and surprising all monks in those regions in asceticism and virtue, was then so deluded by demonic dreams and revelations that he reverted to Judaism and circumcision. In order to deceive him, the devil often showed him dreams that turned out to be true, in this way making him more ready to accept his final act of deception. One night he showed him the Christian people with the apostles and martyrs, downcast and filled with shame, wasting away with dejection and grief, while on the other side he showed him the Jewish people with Moses and the prophets, surrounded by light and living in joy and gladness. The deceiver then advised him to be circumcised if he wanted to share in the blessedness and joy of the Jewish people. He was deceived and followed this advice. From all this, it is clear that none of those people would have been deluded in this pathetic and miserable fashion had they possessed the gift of discrimination. In reply to this, Germanos said, By means of these recent examples and the statements of the fathers of old, you have made it clear that discrimination is the source, root, crown, and common bond of all the virtues. But we would like very much to know how we can acquire it and how we can recognize the true kind of discrimination which comes from God and distinguish it from the false and fictitious kind that comes from the devil. Abba Moses then said, true discrimination comes to us only as a result of true humility. And this in turn is shown by our revealing to our spiritual fathers not only what we do, but also what we think. By never trusting our own thoughts, by following in all things the words of our elders, regarding as good what they have judged to be so. In this way, not only does the monk remain unharmed through true discrimination and by following the correct path, but he is also kept safe from all the snares of the devil. It is impossible for anyone who, who orders his life on the basis of the judgment and knowledge of the spiritually mature to fall because of the wiles of the demons. In fact, even before someone is granted the gift of discrimination, the act of revealing his, true, his base thoughts openly to the fathers weakens and withers them. For just as a snake, which is brought from its dark hole into the light, makes every effort to escape and hide itself, so the malicious thoughts that a person brings out into the open by sincere confession seek to depart from him. In order to give you a more accurate understanding of this virtue by means of an example, I shall tell you of something that Abba, that Abba Serapion once did and which he used to speak about to those who came to him for help. He used to say, When I was a young man, I lived with my spiritual father, and at mealtimes, prompted by the devil, I would steal a rusk as I got up from the table and eat it without my father's knowledge. 
Because I persisted in this habit, I was utterly overcome by it and was unable to conquer it. Though I was condemned by my own conscience, I was ashamed to speak of it to my father. But through God's love it happened that certain brethren came to the old man for advice and asked him about their thoughts. The elder replied that nothing so harms a monk and brings such joy to the demons as the hiding of one's thoughts from one's spiritual father. He also spoke to them about self-control. As this was being said, I came to myself, thinking that God had revealed my past mistakes to the elder. I was pricked with compunction and began to cry, throwing from my pocket the rest which I had stolen as usual. Casting myself to the ground, I begged his forgiveness for my past faults and his prayers for my future safety. Then the old man said, My child, your confession has freed you, although I was silent. You have slain the demon that was wounding you because of your silence by expressing openly what you were keeping to yourself. Until this moment, you are ensured that he would be your master by not opposing or rebuking him. From now on, however, he will no longer find room in you since he has been brought out of your heart into the open. The old man had not finished speaking when the energy of the demon could be seen coming out of my breast like the flame of the lamp. It filled the room with a nasty smell so that those present thought that a lump of sulfur was burning. Then the elder said, Look, through this sign the Lord has borne witness to my words and to your deliverance. Thus, as the result of my confession, the passion of gluttony and the demonic energy left me, and I never again felt any such desire.